the best from the Sky Knight. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks for that. Appreciate that. Um, thanks so much for, for pitching up. I really appreciate it. Uh, it's sort of nice to see such a nice crowd out here. Um, last time I was out in your country, well, in uh, Wellington, it's 10 years ago, so it's quite interesting to see all, of, all the shifts that have happened since and, uh, and the fact that over here with the, the, the battles that have taken place and those that have been won or lost and which advances and retreats have happened and all the rest. So thanks to all the previous speakers as well. Um, I thought I'd show you a whole bunch of pretty pictures. Right? Um, because people are visual animals anyway and they like pictures. Right? And it also helps you get a grasp of things a little bit better, I think, if, if, if maybe you show a couple of images. Um, and it's also to help point out that I'm, I'm not just a, a complete lone wolf, that I am speaking under, I guess, organizational discipline. <coughs> I'm speaking on behalf of this uh, new institute, Institute for Anarchist Theory and History, which has just been established in, uh, in Brazil, in Sao Paulo, in Brazil. At the moment, it's, uh, it's South Africans and Brazilians who are on board. Um, but we're hoping to uh, extend it out right across the, the planet. There's some really interesting uh, researchers uh, from places like Korea, Peru, etc. Um, and uh, uh, Canada's been producing some fantastic work on, uh, on the Mackinvis movement, etc. Uh, so there's really interesting studies are starting to emerge, in part driven by the collapse of the Soviet Union opening up the Soviet archives. A whole bunch of new uh, research has become accessible to historians. Um, so really what I'm talking about is, in part, it's about our uh, where our research is going. But hopefully it's not just some dusty academic kind of thing. I'm not an academic. I never went to university. Um, and I always like making snide comments about those guys. Uh, although my co-author is, he's an academic. Um, <laughs> and, uh, but, but really what we're trying to look at is the question that everybody will come at me with is, well, has it ever worked anywhere? You know, is this practical at all? Is, you know, where's the pragmatism in all of this? It's all, it's, it's crazy, it's delusional, it's utopian, right? So we always have to come back to them and say, well, no, it's actually pragmatic. The problem is, I think, that we've we spent a lot of time uh, building up our own mythology in the past. A lot of our history has been reduced to this North Atlantic uh, minority tendency that has a bunch of great songs and really is a bit of a, a, bit of a museum piece. Uh, that relates to some really proud and brave, but essentially lost cause. Actually, I think historically that's a lot of nonsense. So capitalism, right? We're all living under it. Be calm until impact. Sort of modernization of the old class pyramid. I'm sure a lot of you have seen that uh, previously. Guys at the top essentially into parasites, profiteering off those who do all the work uh, down below. With a couple of their overseers and functionaries in the middle. And a nice uh, logo relating to Africa, where she's at at the moment, is just the largest ever natural gas find has just been uh, unearthed off Mozambique around the, um, the border of Tanzania. So we're, we're expecting imminently to see a huge distortion of wealth pouring into that area, a huge sort of maldevelopment uh, of extractive industries uh, in what is one of the poorest countries of the world. So stay tuned to that. It's going to be really interesting what develops there. Sorry, I'm going to walk around a bit. So Yes, you keep going in and out of the frame. Do I keep going in and out of the frame? <laughs> I'm trying to follow you. This, this way, so that I'm not actually getting that. So, that would be much easier. All right, and then we're supposed to be getting back.
capitalism keeps on going through these periods of crises, you know, its, it's death has long been foretold, but it seems to be very slow in dying. Um, it's like some guy in those Monty Python things, you hack all of his limbs off and he's still, he's still arguing with you. Um, so this damn thing doesn't seem to want to die. Uh, the woodpeckers of Stormy Petrol's thing uh, is kind of street slang that came out of the Spanish Revolution. And basically, if you were seen as being a, a reformist, somebody who kind of kept their head down, hid out in their little hole, you were a woodpecker. And if you kind of rode the storms of the revolution, you were Stormy Petrol. Um, but, but how does one do this, you know? How do you actually confront capitalism in crisis? One of the things that you often get told is, well, we need to speak truth to power. Okay? This is a very famous uh, photograph. Um, and if you would be able to pull back, you'd see that this line of tanks is kind of battalion long. There's about 50 tanks in a row. This brave guy with his shopping uh, in, his, in, his, in his bag stopped this whole row of tanks during the Tiananmen Square uprising in 1989 in China. Um, and then at some point, he climbed up on top of the tank and sort of remonstrating with the tank commander. But basically, for a long period of time, he, you know, he brought this whole row of tanks to stop. And it's, it, it, I mean, he should have been Time Magazine's person of the century, I think. But is this sufficient? I mean, every, I mean, this guy clearly managed to get through to the humanity of the tank commander in this remarkable incident. But this is unfortunately how power usually responds to truth and speech, right? This is the Marikana massacre in my own country uh, in 2012 when heavily armed police who had no training whatsoever in crowd control were sent in quite apparently deliberately to gun down striking workers, 34 of whom were killed. Uh, it's since come out in the commission inquiry that one of the guys uh, who'd been shot uh, six times and was lying on the ground you know, and the police come up to him kick him and harass him and say where's the weapon where's the weapon and when he could barely respond shoot him again all right this is our great democracy by the way so how do you respond to that you know and what does effective resistance look like is it this kind of thing so interesting stuff coming out of Istanbul uh, last year, and what's crucial about Istanbul was that the uprising was, wasn't sparked by radicalism or what have you, it was sparked by what we're seeing time and time and time again, small scale and large scale, is basically guys who've got their eye on the money trying to steal what belongs to us all collectively, okay, trying to steal the commons from us, the commoners in this one, right? So does effective resistance look like this, and you know, they are theorists, who've arisen up to say, well, what we need is some sort of insurrectionist, catalytic inspiration. We need, we need people to go to the front lines, throw co uh, Molotov cocktails, and provoke an insurrection. Inspire the working class to move, okay? Luigi Galliani of Italy uh, in the uh, late 1900s, early 20th, early 20th century, Genoa of the UK uh, from the 1960s onwards, right? Or does it look a bit more like this? This is, this is uh, the Occupy movement, uh, as she's really intended to be, uh, in Barcelona. Okay? He's got no how to occupy. Right? Uh, a different kind of dynamic, an organizational mass mobilization. Now, both, I think, are probably legitimate in their own rights, but we'll get back to that later. He has representatives of that kind of line of thinking, both from back then and, and here now. And we hope he's trying to emphasize the fact that not everybody is, is, is required by the rules to grow a beard, right? <laughs> uh, so you have Domingo Spasa of Brazil, who's known as the, the Brazilian Bakunin, and uh, Melissa Sepulveda, who now heads up the student movement. She was elected to that position as an anarchist in Chile current, right? Okay, so what the heck does this submarine have to do with this guy? Right. Well, 
you need a basic definition uh, because I'm not quite sure where you, you all come from and we all come from different places. So I had to come up with a bit of a thumbs up uh, t-shirt definition. Those who make the decisions on what work needs to be done are the same people as those who carry out the decisions and do the work are the same people as those who benefit from the work done. Uh, obviously this needs a little asterisk and a little sub clause that says, okay, if you are disabled and unable to work, then we will take care of you, etc. But uh, that's, a, that's a way that sort of I, as I said, thumb sucked to kind of try to strip it down to the t-shirt definition. Um, this just shows you the, uh, uh, the covers of some of the books that we've been producing. The Black Flame's out already. Global Fire, Black Flame took 10 years of research. Global Fire is still in process. Black Flame is essentially the, the theoretical volume. Global Fire is the historical volume, which is why it's taking so long to produce, because we, you know, we have to come up with global work across history, really. Um, this uh, Mass Line uh, series, and that's the, the Brazilian edition, uh, is, is organizational studies. And the one that came out last year, which this talk is mostly kind of based on, is cartography. Um, okay, so the Institute is going in a whole bunch of interesting different directions, and they're not all represented here. But this will give you an idea of where the research is going, and it's going in a lot of very exciting directions because um, anarchism is, you know, and as I was taught when I was a young anarchist, when I was growing up, and, uh, learning these things, they were essentially, we were told, it was, it was almost represented to us as some kind of martyrological cult, you know, and it was this rosary, you know, he used to talk about, you know, the Hager Market Martyrs and, you know, the, the Chant of Amiens in, in 1806, and if, if you don't know any of these things, it doesn't matter, don't worry about that, but, you know, there, there, there were basically like five key events that we kept on going round and round and round and round in circles about these things. And a lot of them were monstrous failures, actually. So it, it, it wasn't a very uplifting martyrology, and it wasn't a very uplifting little rosary either. But what we found over the years by, by and I think we, we spoke, look, Lucy Van Vogt, my co-author, who's a sociologist uh, based in, in South Africa, uh, and I, we started out this thing, we, we did not start with the intention of writing books, we started uh, uh, rewriting a pamphlet and just, Came the monster in the basement, kind of fed it and fed it, and then it out through the house. Okay. Uh, but basically, the idea was to say, well, you know, we're on the outside. You know, we're on the periphery, looking in at the metropole. You know, we're in before the ex-colonial world, looking in at, at the global centre. And the story that we're hearing about anarchism from the global centre doesn't really sit well with us as people who are living on the outside. And I'm not quite sure what it's like for Pakeha and Maori either. You know. Because you're also on the global periphery, right? You may be essentially first world in some respects, as are certain little chunks of South African society, but in many respects, you're on the outside looking in. So, you know, does this theory, does this practice have anything for you at all? Or is it, is it some like exotic flower that looks nice, okay? Maybe you can tender it in a little hothouse at the back of your garden, like a like an orchid or something, it's very pretty and you can look at it and you can just spray it every now and again and make sure that it's, it stays pretty, or, or is, it, is it practical? Is it, is it something that can actually take root in Aotearoa soil without all the special bits and pieces, right? Okay, so, so counter power really has these two volumes. The one is the black thing, the politics theory, uh, strategy and tactics. Um, Global fire, which is the one coming out now, the, the, the black... Uh, uh, the, the black cover, uh, ideological and organizational lineages. Uh, in cartography, which, which is the one I'm looking at now, to, to, to an extent, all, all my talks are going to these others, uh, various theories coming up. Bandera, uh, Critical Mass is one of mine. Bandera Negra is produced by Philip Pereira of, of Brazil. I'm going to go into all this in detail later, so don't worry about it. And then there's a bunch of transnational studies, because we find that Anarchists have even self-compartmentalized into national blocks in terms of the way they think about their own history. And sometimes it's not necessarily nationalist, but it's driven by their understanding of a particular language. If you're Francophone, you have a certain view of anarchist history, 
that really relates to how the French anarchist movement saw anarchist history. And the same goes for the English speaking movement, which I must say, as somebody who you know speaks the language, has been rather impoverished by our own poor sense of our history. Anyway, so there's a bunch of transnational studies, there's a bunch of organizational studies, and then there's a bunch of individual studies. And these all come out of this uh, thing. If I had asked you to sort of color in a, a picture of the anarchist world over the past 150 years, you probably wouldn't think of something as potent as this. Uh, certainly you wouldn't be looking at places most likely in Central Asia, the Middle East, tropical Africa. Places like this would probably fall completely off your map because essentially you've been taught your history by the North Atlantic. It's your own history, but you've been, it's really been skewed by the North Atlantic. And what you do see here, uh, okay, the, the black is successful anarchist syndicalist revolution, so we've got Spain here, Ukraine, Manchuria, and Guangzhou in southern China, right? And I'll get into explaining those now. The, the darker red is where you have an anarchist union dominance, as in your FOL is your, your big union federation here. Sorry? CTU. Yeah. CTU, yeah. okay? So that would be like your CTU is, is anarchist, right? So look at that, right across the bulk of Latin America, certainly in Portugal, France, the Netherlands, uh, at one point in the, in the, in the 1890s, right? Uh, significant minority unions in a lot of the other parts of the world, and significant networks in those parts of the world that you don't expect to hear of anarchists at all. Alright, so a lot of the, the Marxist take on, on, on the anarchist movement is, well, you know, this, it's about declining artisanal classes, uh, you know, shoemakers who are now coming up against the Fordist production line in shoemaking and always, and they were sitting there stitching each individual shoe together. Now they, they're getting pushed into the margins. They, 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 their jobs are being disappeared, and essentially they're a bunch of grumpy, petty bourgeois guys, right? Well, that's not really true, right? And although the anarchist movement has a very broad definition of what the working class is, in other words, it's, it's the poor, the unemployed, the, the actual workers, the peasantry as well, and those of you who essentially need to earn a crust, otherwise you're out in the street. Right, so it's a, much, it's a much broader definition. And it did have penetration in these, in these green uh, colored areas, uh, Morelos in, uh, in uh, southern Mexico, in uh, the highlands of Bolivia, Patagonia, etc., Zaporizhia in, uh, in Ukraine, Shinman, etc., in Manchuria, and so forth. Um, overwhelmingly, when you look at membership figures of anarchist organizations, you see that what you're talking about is uh, shipbuilders and stevedores and metal workers and bricklayers and you know, it's the industrial working class. This book here, look at it, you really can't read it, it's ridiculously expensive, is looking at anarchism and syndicalism in the colonial and post-colonial world. It's a great book and we're hoping to on the sly make all of its essays just available on the internet etc because it really looks at the fact that when Marxism came to the fore and a little bit later the anarchist movement came to the fore, you, know, you have, you have uh, Marx and Engels essentially uh, in the wake of the 1848 uprisings in, in Europe against the various, uh, the various empires saying, you know, these, these guys in Eastern Europe are Essentially, they're not just behind the curve in terms of development, so they, they're not as advanced as us Germans, but they're, they are ethnically reactionary. You know? As an ethnicity, Slavs are reactionary. They're not as developed as us Germans. And they get the same attitude coming out when they talk about the American invasion of Mexico. Saying, isn't it great that American capitalism is advancing and taking over from these lazy, bloody Mexicans? 
right? So you can imagine that with that kind of attitude, that, that Marxism isn't having a whole lot of resonance in the colonial and post-colonial worlds, right? Whereas the anarchist movement says automatically, you guys are all on board. Bakunin says, you know, what happens when 80 million Asiatics suddenly arise from their sleep, right? Okay, so, so Global Fine, which is the second volume of the two volumes set, takes a look at these organizational ideological lineages, like I said, and that can get fairly complicated, right? Which is why it's taken us 13, 15 years, however long it's taken, right? I mean, that's just the French anarchist movement, um, excluding, by the way, the, the syndicalists, right? Uh, since 45. All right, Bandera Negra, what, uh, what the Brazilians are doing, and it's, 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 it's coming out of the Federacion Anarquista Uruguay. Um, so the, the FAU was founded in 1956 and uh, formed a very uh, intense fighting organization against the, the dictatorship that was established in 72. And uh, when they started out, to be honest, their theory was pretty shaky, but trust me, it, uh, it got a lot tighter very quickly in those situations of disappearance, torture, and murder at the hands of, of the dictatorship. Um, so there's some very, and, and, and uh, since they rebuilt in 1985, you've seen uh, they've had this dramatic impact on the, the reconstruction of the anarchist movement throughout Latin America. So essentially what they have here, in, in Marxism you have this theory, and look, I, I'm not a specialist in Marxism, that's my, that's my co-author, uh, but essentially there's a theory of the, of the base and the superstructure, and the base um, essentially being the, the, the economic realm, what goes on there determines what happens in the superstructure, which is the political realm. Their theory is a little bit more nuanced here. What we've got is these three interdependent spheres, right? The political, juridical, and military sphere, the economic, and then the cultural and ideological sphere. And these kind of work, they're sort of in dynamic tension with each other. The three spheres of what they call the social, they work interdependently. They influence each other, they have relative autonomy, but they do cross over. Uh, each sphere and each intersection is a potential site of human agency, that is, that the people live, occupying that space um, can decide to move in their own rights. Okay? They're not just driven this way and that by the winds, but they can actually take decisions and, and become a, a motivating factor within that sector of society. Right? And they can therefore be a generator of what the Brazilians call social force. All right? Uh, and the, the struggle in all of these three spheres is to, to take power away from this, uh, this elite minority power structure, which they uh, theorize as a culture of dominance, and create rather a, uh, a majority uh, class power that uh, is really about the autonomy of the class. Then they take a look at this sort of contestation within the anarchist movement and say, okay, well, there's, there's three main areas of, 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 of anarchist theory. Um, and they've obviously gone back to the historical record and, you know, 15 decades of anarchist writings and they've sort of reduced it down to these three elements. Obviously, a key thing is a critique of domination. And, 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 and by this, we're not just talking the state or even the state and capital, even the state and capital and land orderism, it goes right down to the, the intimate dominations in an interpersonal relationship, okay? Anarchists have always been the most trenchant critics of domination in all its, uh, in all its spheres, not just merely uh, the state and capital, okay? Another key uh, issue is, of course, the, the, the defense of what the... Latin American Center for Autogestion of Self-Management. That essentially you don't need to be told what to do. Not only do you have better and more humane and more human-scaled skills to grapple with the uh, challenges that society throws at you or that the, the, you know, real life throws at you, but 
um, that this is this is crucial to to your liberation. And then he's got what they call main theory. Now main theory is revolves around four main debates. There's one debate around uh, organizational anti-organization. You know, should we should there be a specific organization that calls itself anarchist and goes out there and says we're the anarchists and this is what we believe and da da da? Or should things be more organic? Right? That's one of the key debates. Uh, one of the it can sometimes be a bit of a red herring, but there's a question of violence or antiviolence. Now what is it? And how do we use it? Is it a mass tactic? that we only employ tactically at certain points, so if somebody crosses a picket line, we say, no, we stand in the way, no ways. Um, or are we going to set off a uh, car bomb somewhere uh, outside a bank window um, to try and uh, provoke people? So quite a bit of debate, obviously, around the, uh, the functions and the use circumstances under which violence is either tolerable or intolerable within the movement. Um, the green one, I'm not sure how clear this is for you guys, but the green one, immediate reforms or are we anti-reformist? Are we going to be quite curious and quite radical right there out, out there on edge and say that, look, forget unions, okay, because they're all always reformist, or are we going to take your approach and say, well, look, I'm going to learn a hell of a lot within the union. Okay, I'm going to know my way around the law, I'm going to know my, my way around the industry, and I'm going to get to know fellow workers. And besides, we need to fight for immediate gains, right? Because, you know, the, the guys' kids are starving now. Um, let's try and feed them this week and not wait for the revolution to come to feed them. Right? Crucial debates as well. And then, of course, do we have either programmatic or flexible organization? And this is basically what the Brazilians have broken down to do the four main debates within uh, what they call main theory. So violence, organization, uh, prog uh, programmatic or flexible organization, and immediate reforms or uh, rejection or reforms. Then they, they, they basically say, look, what we're talking about is concrete reality. We're talking about real people uh, in concrete really dominated social classes within which the anarchist movement arises and finds its historic role as not a parachuting in bunch of missionaries or saviors or whatever, but as part of the social processes. Um, and what we're aiming at is just shifting that bar away from the system, system of domination to, towards the system of self-management. And that requires both tactics and strategies, tactics, being sort of the building blocks as you go along sort of a short-term program towards a general strategy so that you're not losing yourself you know you're not in a situation where you can't see the woods for the trees where basically you know you're fighting these small battles but each battle sort of dies out as it inevitably will on a single single issue trajectory but if you're not using that to then catapult into the next tactic the next strategy building a longer term uh, objective towards self-management, then you're getting a little lost. Okay, so that's, uh, that's the Brazilian's perspective. Th this now I'm getting into, uh, into my book, Counter Power, which is really just a pocket global anarchist history in a lot of ways, okay? It's, it's pretty crude. I wrote it over the space of one month. And I had a bit of a gap in the United States, um, but based on you know ten years of research that have gone on previously, so hopefully I know what I'm talking about. Uh, and really, what what I'm trying to do is, is give people jumping off points. If you read through it, hopefully you'll come across something and you say, "Really, Fiji, 1916? What the heck? You know, isn't there a way that we can ex you know dig into that a little bit further and find out what's going on?" Okay, so one of, but one of the important things coming from Felipe and the, uh, and the uh, Brazilians is, is to say that you know, there's, there's a huge amount of shyness uh, anarchists around this concept of power. Obviously, we're anti-power, etc. Well, actually, no, we're not anti-power at all. Power is mainly the ability to do stuff. 
you know, feeding that woman's kids, getting the road built that needs to be built, etc. Um, that's just the ability to do that. that. That's all power is. The real question is, how is power exercised? Who makes the decisions? Who carries them out? Etc. Right? It's the democratization of power that anarchism is about. It's about the decentralization of power. We want communities, working class communities, to have the power to do things. This is completely separate to the capture of the state as an instrument of power, by the way, just to make that explicit, right? We're operating at this level, at the horizontal level, not there, okay? This is not princesses and frogs, it's the peasantry, right? So what you find is, you go back in the historical record, you say, wow, you know, the anarchists have actually made really many significant attempts at trying to establish power over cities and broader areas, right? And there's a whole range of them you now. I won't necessarily go into them. I've ranked them in terms of you know, the ones in black are the, the, the sort of what we've determined to be the successful anarchist revolutions. Um, you, you'll notice that, that Mexico is not in the mix, and that's simply because we're saying if we're really talking about a revolution, capital R, then we need a certain longevity to the thing. Uh, because otherwise, there's not enough time for them to actually implant their ideas and to actually practice what they preach. So we need to look at places like uh, the Chinese city of Guangzhou, where the anarchists ran the city for three years before we can say, OK, here's anarchism in practice. Okay. Um, so the others are <coughs> you know, good effort, but no cigar, unfortunately. Right? But very useful learning experiences for all of us. Okay? Um, the ones in purple are crucial as well because these are these are nationalist um, uprisings that had significant anarchist influence, and you'll notice that we peg Russia as being one of those as well. Right? Um, we do differentiate between those kind of revolutionary rehearsals, if you will, and we've uh, highlighted a few there: Encarnacion in Paraguay, where they took over the city of Encarnacion for a whole 16 hours. Unfortunately, in 1931, uh, Baja California in uh, in Mexico, uh, southern France in, in the 1870s, uh, which is not as well known as the Paris Commune, but the same era, etc. Right? Different uh, different places around the world. The differentiation between that and you know the real deal, the actual full-blown revolution, where anarchists had sufficient time, even though they were usually continually harassed by reactionary forces, to actually plant. A, a revolution in uh, both its industrial, social, and uh, political aspect. Um, everybody's seen this picture, right? The original picture. I think I've identified who she is. <coughs> Maria Garcia, right? Uh, fought in the Spanish Revolution under the anarchist bricklayer Cipriano Mera. Um, Survived the war, survived concentration camps in, in North Africa, and eventually uh, died of old age in, uh, in France. Right, so what we're coming up with is, is this concept of a five forces theory. You know, how, how did they get to this point? How, how did they challenge power? Well, you need to have at least five forces. And look, this isn't a mechanical model in the, in, in the sense that, unfortunately, the machine doesn't always work perfectly. There's often missing bits, right? So what we have here is your, your specific anarchist organizations, and bear in mind this can be, should be plural, there should be many, many of these, right? And it doesn't necessarily grow automatically outwards. Uh, your, your industrial bodies, your, your trade unions, uh, your local grassroots bodies, such as your, your, um, your Soviets, etc., that, that will make decisions around uh, how food and shoes and whatever is distributed, and eventually there'll be some sort of regional deliberative body. All of these are kind of required. They don't necessarily develop in, in that in that line, but there is a there is a gradient from let's say uh, bodies of tendency that relate to particular political tendency and bodies of class. Right? All of these forces are required to operate in civil society. Uh, in order to achieve critical mass. Things get a little bit more complicated when you start actually modeling these and taking a look at the real models. One of the important things is to, to develop peripheral vision, right? 
So although we're focusing here on Ukraine, for instance, we're looking sideways to what's happening in Russia and to uh, Siberia as well. So we're not looking at Ukraine in isolation, because Ukraine, Ukraine wasn't necessarily happening in isolation. So what's happening here? Is there any articulation? I'm looking here in particular at the, at the Trans-Siberian Railway as, pro as a most probable transmitter of ideas and practices between revolutionary Ukraine and revolutionary Siberia. You'll notice though that Siberia, or the numbers here are much smaller, the, uh, the union there, 16,000, it's an IWW formed in, uh, in, in the coal fields in, in 1919, only 10,000, sorry, 16,000 strong, uh, as compared to uh, the 30,000 strong IWW coal fields in the Donetsk Basin here, right? So smaller, but not only that, but they didn't develop the additional layers that were, were, were crucial, which is why you don't hear about the Siberian Revolution, because there wasn't one. There was an attempt, there was a, an attempt at power, etc. You look at uh, um, comparative organization strengths, one of the things to recognize is that, you know, this is the CGT in France, two and a half million members almost in 1922, but they're reformist. These much smaller bodies, like here in Ukraine, Russia, and Germany, uh, are, to some extent, far more potent. The famous Spanish CNT, which obviously this stage, stage 1919, is quite small, then grows to 2 million members in 1937, only manages to organize half the industrial working class. The Portuguese, which is here, 1922, um, is numerically, I mean, by, comparatively, I should say, uh, by head of population, a much larger organization. Okay, so the size of something doesn't necessarily determine, you know, the whole thing about it's, uh, it's the size of the fight and the dog, not the size of the dog in the fight. It's that kind of thing. Then we look regionally and say, okay, well, where are the, uh, the fellow organizations? They scattered around all over the place. What are their relative strengths, etc.? What are their orientations? Can they come to their aid? Who's closest? Well, the Bulgarians are closest, but there's, there's an allied blockade in their way. Right? So we start to look at things a bit more geographically in terms of balance and forces. Then we narrow down and say, okay, what's happening here? This is nationalist, the two nationalist blocks, which in September 1919 come together. The red here, in fact, within the, the red, the red border is kind of your, your, your anarchist dominated zone, although it kind of shifts around as the war progresses. Big anarchist victories here, Perikonovka, Perikop, etc. But, you know, the, 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 the magnetists tend to get produced to the little red spots here, which in fact the anarchist armed, the, 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 the magnetists armed forces. What about the specific organizations? What about the, uh, the Soviets? And what about the, the industrial unions? Take a look at the size of these cities. Uh, you, you cut the Renaissance, 1917 population, uh, 220,000. Mariupol, population in the same year, 45,000. Verdansk, 47,000. Guliapolia, the, the, the center of, of the anarchist revolt, was supposedly a village. Well, yeah, a village with 25,000 people. How does that relate to uh, Wellington, right? The Donbass coal fields are, are in fact the largest industrial region in Europe at the time. Okay, so peasants and pitchforks is not necessarily about that. Okay, let me go into this kind of thing. Structures get really complicated. This is only Catalonia, right, in December of 1936. And, okay, I mean it's crazy, right? All, all the blues, the, the unions, the reds, the armed forces, the blacks, specific organizations. Uh, the pink is Mahir's leaders, right? But let's focus on this layer, which is often forgotten, right? Here you have the CNT district committees, the prison support groups, the cultural centers, the consumer co-ops and the modern schools. Those in many respects are crucial because that is where the union articulated with the population. Right? So yeah, all the the industrial union federations and the regional union federations were crucial, as were the armed squads, the defense committees, all that kind of thing. But this is where the rubber hit the road, right? So we need to mine down into that kind of thing. 
All right, so we go into this. This is a thing called on the waterfront class geography. We're looking at, uh, well, it, class geography, I'm, I'm comparing the class geography of, at the moment, Buenos Aires, Cape Town, and Barcelona in the pre war era. And here you see what's happening, right? Here are the unions, the two big union federations. This is the one that is uh, uh, the anarcho syndicalist one. This is the anarcho communist one. And they have their own uh, specific organizations that are allied to them. What you see that is important is La, La Boca, which is a working class district, is cheap by the job, by the job, the docks. So that's really crucial. In South Africa, the situation is completely different. The, the black working class is six kilometers away from the docks. They're deliberately separated out, out by racial, racialized class geography to be away from the dogs, right? So that narrowness is crucial. These guys tend to get often lost in the mix. So do the, the wobblies, but these guys are the resistance societies upon, so what, uh, upon which so much of the actual uh, resilience of the working class was built. And in fact, those resistance societies often outlived the actual form of unions. Because they were, uh, they were social. They were functions of the class more than social, more than functions of particular industry. All right, and so on and so forth. Okay, the, there's the different five waves of uh, rising and falling, anarchist militancy. The important thing there is to really just recognise that because anarchism has really been a factor of the working class, our fortunes have risen and fallen along with the class. It's not just uh, hostile Marxist historiography, it's that our fortunes are intimately tied to that of the class. Where the class is defeated, we're defeated. Okay? We, we can't sail on some artificial cushion of hot air like people who are funded by the state, right? <laughs> we operate quite differently. When we're smashed, we're probably smashed. Right? Okay, then go, go through these different waves. First wave is. Oh, we've got about five minutes. Okay, I'll, I'll maybe whip through it very quickly. Should we maybe talk outside once we, once we lock up? If you can find me, plenty of bars, cafes. Okay, yeah. so, uh, okay, so, okay, so the five waves, we don't necessarily need to go through them, but bearing in mind that we did run city like Malaga and not just the city itself, but the, that uh, uh, flat land around it, the actual. Uh, I forget the municipal demarcations, but essentially the, the province around it. Um, take a look at the emergence of the movement, and it comes out in, in different kind of uh, styles in a way, uh, many of which were shaped by the linguistic blocks within which they arose. Um, you, you see the size of the trade unions here, uh, 60,000 in Spain by, by 1873, 30,000 in, in in Italy by 1974, uh, 50,000 in, in, um, in Mexico uh, by, was it, 1882. This is a time when the, the Marxist wing of the international was a thousand strong international. And they had the cheek to say that they were the majority, right? Anyway, right, so a whole bunch of really interesting people spring up. Alberto Tutta, Luis Michel. What's interesting about this is just to, just to note that People don't necessarily come to the fore uh, in their own home countries. There's uh, Louise Michel here in New Caledonia. She only becomes an anarchist on the way on, on the, the prison boat out to the South Seas. Um, people are rising uh, simultaneously around the world, uh, both in Australasia and in um, the Caribbean and all the rest. It's not a, a European idea that transmits outwards. It arises simultaneously transnationally. Um, you get some, the second wave, start to see this consolidation, this great spread of movements around the world, differentiated different kind of syndicalist vectors. And importantly, the, the mauve there in places like, like India and in, in Southwest Africa and Kenya, etc. These represent uh, syncretic movements, movements that are inspired by the anarchist movement, but are often uh, mixed in with uh, national liberation movements and not necessarily explicitly anarchist. But you'll see how the movement really entrenches itself there in Latin America and, and spreads really dramatically really across the world, where you see um, 
uh, those, those colored blocks, those colored dates, those are where the movement really consolidates in, in a mass form. Uh, the white blocks is where they get crushed. Again, a whole bunch of really fascinating people, uh, which unfortunately I can't go into in detail, but you'll see that we're talking about a, a MOOC. There's no such thing, as far as we're concerned, as a third world anarchism, or as a, a global southern anarchism, or a non-western anarchism, because you know I think we've done sufficient studies to say that although in certain circumstances, such as uh, Bolivia in the 30s, or Bul Bulgaria in the same period, the anarchist really adapted to local conditions by relying on local traditions of mutual aid, etc. Aymara and Bulgarian peasant traditions of mutual aid to make their message uh, not seem alien, to make people realize that this is basically a, a human, there's a human com commonality here, it's not a, it's not a, it's not a great innovation or whatever, it's just about solidarity. There is this universal message, it, it, it's, it's hard to find any real significant deviations from the message. Of course, and I guess we're involved in class portrayals as well. Anyway, it goes right through, show you pictures maybe you haven't seen, the Manchurian Revolution, you've got Korean, Chinese, and Manchurian, uh, and it's all working together there. The third wave of expansion, one of the things is important to recognize is that, you know, the, the Anarchist movement doesn't stop dead in 1939 when it gets defeated by Franco in Spain. It continues. In fact, the Second World War uh, doesn't change things in Latin America much at all because Latin America isn't in the war. And it doesn't change things much in, in, uh, in the Far East because they've been at war since 1910. Okay? So, you know, 1939 means nothing to them, and 19, 1945 is a little bit more important because the Japs eventually get defeated. Um, there we go, okay, again, in that period, really interesting bunch of people from around the world. Some are explicitly anarchists in BT, Asharai from India, I've, I've pegged him in, uh, in uh, Afghanistan there, because he was rather ironically, although a lifelong anarchist, he was, he was uh, Lenin's delegate to the, uh, uh, the Indian exile, uh, government in exile in Kabul in that period. Um, Augusto Sandino, also, a, well, unlike Achirai, a syncretic figure, Petronilla Infantes in Bolivia, a, essentially the leader of the, the syndicalist movement in Bolivia from the 1930s until it's eventually crushed by the progressive regime in 1964, right? Right. Um, Thank you, Michael. If I may, yeah. I can turn you away from that. <laughs> We're going to have to leave this And that's who the subject's name is. In about five minutes. You're going to have to follow this man out. And you're going to have to drag him to a cafe. <laughs> at least no coffee, because it won't stop. <laughs> and, and we're going to try to While you're wrapping up, any, 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 any urgent, urgent question? No. And that is in the other thing. Michael, thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Michael is very serious. If you want to carry on this conversation, 